Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Karen Sandler. Uh, I am a lawyer uh, with an engineering background. Uh, this isn't really a legal talk, but because I'm a lawyer, I have to say this is not legal advice. I'm not your lawyer. <laughs> um, Yes. Uh, anyway, now that we moved on from there, uh, I, uh, I'm also the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Um, and I see some t-shirts, yes! Uh, and I am a Debian user and non-uploading Debian developer, which is so cool that there is that category. Um, uh, it makes me feel really invested in the Debian community and want to do more for Debian, and it's really awesome. Um, and I co-organize um, a program called Outreachy, which I'm going to tell you about in this talk. Um, so just to give you a little bit more about who I am as a person and why I'm here and why I care so much, um, I literally have a big heart. Uh, my heart is uh, three times the size of the normal person's heart. It's really like three times as thick, which is totally fine. I'm asymptomatic, except that I am at a very, very high risk of suddenly dying. It's like two to three percent chance per year compounding, and I was diagnosed at 30. So um, it's all fine and good because I have a pacemaker defibrillator, um, except that uh, when I was prescribed the pacemaker defibrillator, I asked about the software on it, of course, um, and asked for the source code um, to no avail. So I can't see the source code in my own body, so I am a cyborg um, <laughs> without being able to see the source in my own body, but I am unique. Um, and sort of confronting the whole, this is a very strange, is there like a lot of, is this bouncing around? Can you hear weirdness when I move? Yeah, is that a little better? Okay, great, tell me if that happens again. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so sort of seeing directly how software how we rely on software, and in my case, the software is literally screwed into my heart, right? I, like, it literally, my life relies on it. It's a metaphor for all the software we rely on, and it made me realize how important the ethics of our software are and how important free and open source software is in particular. And so I went from someone who thought that open source software was cool to someone who thought that software freedom was essential. And that means that I spent a lot of my time worrying about the, um, just the general ethics and safety and general overall state of our software. And it's part of why Debian is so important. Um, but today, I'm mostly speaking as one of these group of people. These are the outreachy organizers. Um, we're a committee of five people. It's still doing it, isn't it? A little bit. A little bit. It's okay. Yeah. Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so uh, so raise your hand if you have heard of Outreachy. Okay, raise your hand if you have never heard of Outreachy. It's great. So there are like uh, there are three or four people here who have not heard of Outreachy. Outreachy is a um, it's a a program um, where we have paid internships for um, underrepresented groups to participate in free and open source software. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about how, these, how the program works. Um, but, uh, but before we, we get there, um, I just wanted to sort of give a, a few minutes to talk about um, how the program came about and why we think it's so necessary. Um, I, one of the funny things about giving this talk is that um, at conferences where often there are so few women and minorities, often a very high percentage of those people attend the talk about the programs to help bring more people. So it's interesting to look around the room and see that this talk in particular, this audience is a more diverse audience than I think is representative of the, um, of the conference as a whole, I think. I, I, my flight got delayed, so I was a little late in coming. Um, but it's still, um, it uh, gives you an idea about how the, the, um, the are, are you fixing the, is that better? Do you want to do it? No, that's a better, okay. Vdale says it's okay, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, um, so, uh, so I just wanted to give a few minutes to talk about first my, you know, my personal experience at these conferences and um, or at conferences in free and open source software generally. Um, I can tell you that. Uh, Lots of times when I show up at conferences, people assume that I'm not really there because I'm interested. They assume I'm there because I'm a spouse or significant other. They assume at more corporate conferences that I'm a marketer, um, despite the fact that I'm so passionate about software freedom and I think about software freedom pretty much all the time. I um, I and and I'm I have a technical background. I was I was an engineer before I went to law school. Despite that fact, when I'm with um, with uh, and I'm executive at a nonprofit, despite the fact. So when I'm at, at a, with other executives of nonprofits, um, you know, trade associations or whatnot, people always assume that I'm the one who doesn't have the technical background and always explain basic technical concepts to me. Whereas the men who are similarly situated, um, some of them, for example, have marketing backgrounds, but nobody ever assumes that they don't have a technical background or couldn't understand what, you know, what was happening. As I, when I check in as a speaker at conferences, people often ask who I'm picking up my badge for. Um, that hasn't happened in a little while. Um, and I, the experiences I've had have been uh, really amazing. I, um, I can also tell you that I have been groped at conferences. Um, I, uh, I, I have been um, uh, hit on uh, within two minutes of getting to the venue. Um, it's, uh, it's just um, a very intense experience. And not everybody has these experiences, and I do attend a lot of conferences, but it only takes like a couple of people who are aggressive jerks for the few women that attend to have a bad time. And um, uh, studies show that the problem is actually a lot more, a lot deeper than that. Because um, in studies where um, people were asked to review patches that were written by, um, by developers, if uh, the patches were identified as being written by women, then they were marked of lower quality. But when the, um, when the gender identities were removed from the patches and were given code review, in general, the ones that were written by women were shown to be rated of a higher quality. So these, um, these biases are deep. Um, and they're prevalent. Um, and I think we all have a lot of unconscious bias that we need to, um, to, to sort of think about. The studies uh, showed out, um, and, uh, and then the, the statistics on the participation of women in particular in free and open source software are pretty abysmal. Um, in software, generally, it's about 25% women, um, and that includes proprietary software and free and open source software. It's, it's about like 17 to 18% of students within the United States are, um, and in many other um, countries it's about that, um, uh, are women. And then, um, and then in the studies for free and open source software, it's like anywhere, the lowest is like many studies, a couple of studies have shown like 1%, one study showed 4%, um, and one study showed 11%. But the most recent study showed, I think, about three or four percent. Um, and so the numbers are really low. So where there are women in computing, they're especially not coming to free and open source software. Um, and I, I keep hoping that these stats are going to change. But uh, and I've had a, this slide up for a while. But uh, but actually, I think that the only thing that has happened is that the the number of students overall that are are women in computing has has uh, has been continually dipping down over time. Um, I think in the 80s it was like 30% and, and it's now uh, down to 17 to 18%. In some places it's starting to increase as diversity initiatives have, um, have started to become successful. So um, we'll see how that develops in the next few years. Um, and, then, um, and then the Wall Street Journal published um, a whole bunch of information um, about tech companies and, um, in the US and their, uh, their data about uh, women participation in technology jobs at their companies and also leadership positions. And so this is a, um, a screenshot from the Wall Street Journal website. And they have, um, uh, they've put these, uh, these just together and you can see the, um, this is, I just picked a random company. I think it's actually Microsoft, but I wasn't like 
necessarily picking on Microsoft. They're all roughly comparable for the big companies. Um, and you can see that, um, that the number of women is quite low, but then the number of um, blacks and Hispanics is also really low. And what, what we found from those studies is that about one to 3% um, you know, of, of the tech workers reported in this studies were black and only two to 4% were Hispanic versus a 13% um, of black and 17% Hispanic within the United States. And so we had been running a program for, uh, for, um, uh, for gender diversity for quite some time. And when the Wall Street Journal published these studies, we realized we had to also expand the program too. So I won't spend too much time on the, um, the justification for the program, um, but I'm happy to talk to anybody about it one-on-one -on -one if you'd like. There are tons of resources out there. Um, the Geek Feminism Wiki has, aggregates a lot of these, um, this information. Um, and there's an interesting uh, study published by Joseph Regal. Um, so there's tons of data out there, and I'm happy to point you to that uh, place if, um, if you want to know more about why these programs are necessary. Um, uh, this program started because in 2006, oh, a question. So the question is, why do we think that, it, uh, that the percentage dips for free software? There are probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, so some of the reasons why, um, uh, why people think that's the case are one, for, for one, it takes a lot of discretionary time to contribute to free and open source software. Um, and, uh, and statistically, men have more of that um, time than, um, than women or, or really any member of these underrepresented groups. Um, there's a thinking that, um, I'll, I'll actually get more to that as I go because what we did was we decided not to worry about what it actually was that was keeping women out of free and open source software and instead take all of the reasons that we thought that women and other underrepresented groups might not be um, participating in free and open source software and address them all systematically and try to, to address them all so that we can overcome all of them without having to identify what it was that we think that might be keeping um, underrepresented people away. And so in 2006, the GNOME project noticed that it had 181 applicants for Google Summer of Code and none of them were women. Zero out of 181. And they were like, well, we have to do something about it. And so in 2006, uh, they launched a program um, called the uh, Outreach Program for Women. And uh, they basically mirrored GSOC, but made it specifically for women. And they did this program, and I think there were six participants that year. Was anyone here like, uh, around, like, participating in the organization of that program in 2006? OK. So um, Molly, maybe, a little bit. She did proselytizing for it. Okay. So in 2006, uh, there were six women that came into the program um, that, uh, that GNOME launched just for GNOME, and, um, and they, had a, 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 they had one summer round where they had those internships, and then um, and the program wasn't, um, it was successful, but it wasn't really that successful because none of the women that participated in the program uh, stuck around in the community. Um, and uh, and it, it basically fizzled out, and, um, and it was just a one-shot deal. And then in 2009, um, uh, at, at, uh, the GNOME Project realized that it needed to do, there were various uh, uh, political things happened, and they realized they needed, they, they had a, a very low participating percentile of women at Guadac, it was like 4%. Um, and, uh, I guess I'll just say and a, a, a possibly sexist comment made by a speaker, and so they decided they needed to revive this program, and, um, and, uh, and I came in as executive director of GNOME shortly after that. And so uh, the outreach program for women was relaunched, and it was reexamined again with all of these sort of tweaking the program to figure out what, um, what works and what doesn't work. Um, so what we, we do now, the program is now called Outreachy, and it's, uh, GNOME is a participating community, but it's, uh, the program is separate from GNOME now, um, and is at the Software Freedom Conservancy, where I'm executive director. Um, and it's, uh, it's a program that happens two times per year. There's a, um, 
there's a summer round and a summer round, depending on <laughs> where you are. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's basically dedicated to uh, support software freedom by increasing diversity. And we've, um, we've generally uh, uh, tracked Google Summer of Code in terms of, um, of inspiration for the program and its basic structure. Um, the program has been really successful. We have dozens of free software communities participating now. Debian participates, Linux kernel participates, um, GNOME still participates. Um, uh, and it changes a little bit every time um, some communities come in and some communities come out. Um, we've had 368 people who have come through the program already, and there are 39 um, working right now on their internships. Um, raise your hand if you were a participant of Outreachy. So awesome. That's like participant, uh, not, a not a mentor. So just a, like a, an intern participant. I think it's the same for, yeah, so like four or five people. It's so great. Um, and, uh, and the program has been really, really impactful. Um, the people who come through this program have been doing a lot of um, amazing things um, during and after their internships, not just in the work that they're doing, but also in the overall impact that they're having on our communities. From those participants, we have a lot of new speakers. Um, I think 75 people have come through their program and have given full-length talks at conferences, which then starts to change the face of free and open source software. And when newcomers come in, they see that there are more, um, that there are diverse people that participate in the project. Um, one of the reasons why um, we think that women are, are, are and, and, and other underrepresented groups are less likely to participate in, te in tech is because there's nobody like them that they see participating in the um, in the community, um, and and it contributes to something called imposter syndrome. Um, imposter syndrome is exactly as it sounds. It's the idea that you um, that you feel like at heart maybe you you're an imposter. You don't belong. That people will discover you ultimately to be the the fake that you are. And lots of people have imposter syndrome. Men and women and everybody. Um, you know, non-binary people, everybody, lots of people have imposter syndrome, but it is very prevalent, especially among, amongst women in tech, um, is, is what studies show. And I can say that I'm someone who has, um, has imposter syndrome. And here's an example. I am probably the only person in the world who has researched, like, medical devices and free and open source software and the legal regime around them. And every time I give my medical devices talk, I'm still terrified that someone is going to discover that I'm a fake and I don't know what I'm talking about. But there's probably nobody else in the world who has focused on these issues quite so much. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. And one of the things that studies show is that because there are fewer role models, you see fewer people who are like you who are, are holding themselves out as experts. Um, you know, you, you, you doubt, your, subconsciously you doubt yourself. And so knowing that there is such a thing as imposter syndrome, and somebody else on stage I heard talk about imposter syndrome when I was uh, uh, earlier in my career, and it was such a relief to hear it. So when I do this talk, I try to mention it because it's good to know that um, this is a thing. It's quite common. Um, and women are just much less likely to hold themselves out as experts. Um, I was interviewed for a documentary Rather, they asked me to, to do an interview for a documentary and, uh, about software patents. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not the person you want to talk about it here. You should talk to these other people. They're much more knowledgeable than me, and they're the right people. And, um, and, uh, and then when I was in the same place as them, the director said, can I sit down with you? And I said, sure. And he closed the door. And I was like, what is going to happen here? This is weird. <laughs> and he said, I have to level with you. Um, I've asked a few women in the field to, to interview for this movie, and none of them have said yes. All of them have said the same thing you have said, which is, you should talk to these other people. I'm probably not the right person. You'll do great if you talk to these other people. But when I ask men and women in the field who I should interview, they mention you. and the, you know, and the and yet you tell me that you're not the right person to be interviewed. What is going on? Why won't you interview for this? Like, why, why were, are you, I can't, he said, I know that there are women who are experts in the field. I can't publish my movie 
if I don't have any of them represented in the movie, I'm going to have to not do the movie because it's not, it doesn't represent the experts in the field, and I won't feel good about it. And so I said, aha, that makes perfect sense. And so I said to him, OK, I will do this interview if you tell me the questions in advance, <laughs> and you promise you won't make me look like an idiot. And he said, you're an expert in the movie. If you don't know what you're talking about, I'm not going to use your footage. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Why would you even worry about that? And, and it suddenly made a lot of sense. And he said it's very hard to find women who will hold themselves out as experts. And so, um, you know, and, and I also find that when I'm at conferences where there are people doing interviews, women are, are, are and, and non-binary people are much less likely to kind of push themselves in and say, hey, if you're looking for someone to interview, I'll do, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and so it's, you know, it's even less, it's potentially even more disproportionate. So I always now sort of check in and say, do you need someone to interview? Because I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> um, and often they say, yes, that's great. We would love to have you interview. They say no. I'm like, great, no problem. Anyway, uh, imposter syndrome is a real thing. Having women speakers, having non-binary speakers, having minority speakers is really important in just making people sh feel that the work that's being done by a diverse group is visible. Um, new mentors. 18 people who have come through the program have become mentors for either Google Summer of Code or Outreachy. And in fact, one mentor, one, sorry, one participant not only became a mentor, but her mentee became a mentor, so she became a grand mentor. <laughs> mm -hmm. So pretty cool. And it's sort of like the impact that this program is having on the community is substantial. Um, new community members. So. Um, uh, we require that participants in the program uh, blog, and so seeing, um, seeing a diverse set of people participating in the community discussions is really important, and as the, uh, the outreach program becomes, uh, you know, becomes older, so we revived it in 2009, and then a few years later we expanded it beyond GNOME and included um, uh, Twisted, which is a Software Freedom Conservancy member project, and then we uh, expanded further to include the Linux kernel and Debian in the very next round, I believe. So, um, uh, seeing so as as the program gets older, people who are partici who participate in the program become more experienced and are becoming leaders of projects, which is amazing. Um, there are uh, uh, participants in the program who have gone on to um, uh, to become. Board members, um, for example, uh, Valerie Young is on the, um, the SPI board um, and, uh, and hold other pr positions of prominence in membership committees or, um, or a variety of very visible and very essential ways in the community. Um, we also have um, new community initiatives that have been formed. So for example, um, there's a, a, a Chicagoans uh, hacking on GNOME. Uh, which was formed by an alum of our program who is also on the GNOME board of directors. Um, and then uh, uh, two women formed the Women, uh, uh, women in Free Software for India um, in Free Software, and, uh, and another woman started the Nairobi Dev School. Um, so initiatives to help bring more people into free software and to help bring free and open source software to a wider group of people um, just from, uh, from our, uh, our program, which is really cool. Um, there have been 15 Debian participants since uh, 2013, um, which is a, quite a lot um, and, and pretty exciting. Um, and they've worked on a variety of, um, of projects from uh, translations to reproducible bills to QA. Um, and, uh, and it really can be just about anything within the project. So how we do the program uh, is that we, one of the things that's really critical to the success of the program is addressing underrepresented people directly. Um, early on in the program, we figured this out because um, we had, I, I spoke to a participant of the program who, I, who had said, you know, she had thought about applying to Google Summer of Code, but it just didn't feel like it was right for her. And she felt like maybe, you know, it, maybe it wasn't uh, it wasn't something that she could do. And then when she saw that uh, that outreach program for women, which is what Outreach was called then, was um, uh, was specifically inviting women, she thought, oh, you know, maybe I could do that. And um, she went on to participate in Google Summer of Code after she did Outreachy. Um, I think 25 people have gone from Outreachy to Google Summer of Code. 
So we're sort of helping, um, helping the people who come through the program find other opportunities and, um, and specifically naming the people that we want to participate who aren't already present in our communities is a really important part of that. Um, we accept students um, as well as non-students. Uh, Google Summer of Code is only for students. And uh, we found this out early because when we were originally designing the program for women to participate in free and open source software, we realized that there are a lot of different parts of times in like a women's career where, um, where there's a common need to reboot. So uh, many people have participated in the program after having children, um, uh, having um, different kinds of uh, changes in their, in their role. Quite a number of women have come through the program who, um, who for various reasons always were interested, who were always interested in, um, in programming, always interested in development, always interested in tech, but, uh, but for various regions felt pressured or for some reason to not, um, to not pursue a career in tech and outreachy was a way to allow them to give that a try and to, and to switch careers. Um, and that's been really helpful. We had one woman who was mopping floors um, when she got the outreachy internship, uh, one woman who was homeless, um, uh, one woman who was working at the cheese counter at Whole Foods. So uh, it's really a really important part of the program that we have um, the opportunities to non-students. And we also provide some opportunities to non-coders. Um, documentation, for example, is a really important way that people can get involved. We also need to value those skills in our community in ways that we don't always. And so by allowing them to be also paid internships, we, put a, we, we show how important they are to us because they're essential to the success of our software generally. Um, and then, um, and then there's a secondary component, which is that some people who are interested in doing development work, but uh, feel like they aren't brave enough to jump in right away or feel like they may not be as skilled, having the chance to participate in another way gives them that bridge. So there was a, a participant uh, who was with the GNOME project who got a marketing internship with Outreachy, and then she took that and then did uh, GSOC as a developer and used that to pivot. Another uh, woman who had an internship at Wikimedia um, did documentation and basically used that to build her relationships and to get confident in the community and then felt strong enough, for, you know, to felt like it was the right time to be able to start contributing as a, um, as a coder and started to do that. Um, we connect participants with mentors. Um, statistics show that, um, that people who are members of underrepresented groups are much less likely to jump into channels and say, hey, can somebody help me with this thing? So having a formal process where we have mentors who are um, designated as being available at a particular time is, uh, is really important for, um, for this success. And then it's good in general because having mentors listed as part of, um, you know, identified as part of the program means that anybody knows that those people are available and happy to help. So it creates mentorship opportunities for everyone, uh, which is really great. Uh, we also require a contribution as part of the application, um, which uh, uh, has been really helpful. Um, making sure that the, the participant can, you know, do the work that's part of the internship is a really important part of that application process, but it's greater than that because everyone who applies to Outreachy becomes a contributor to a free and open source software project. So we only accept about, we accept I think a little less than a third of the applicants that we get generally, but 100% of the people who successfully complete an application can put on their resume that they've contributed to a free and open source software project, which is um, pretty cool and really important. Um, we had over 100 uh, applications uh, per cycle, so it's, um, it's a lot of people. And we do get a lot of repeat applications, so when people don't get accepted the first time, they've already started contributing, and if they continue contributing, they become a much stronger candidate and, um, and often get accepted later. Um, and we, of course, uh, promote the, uh, the, uh, the program as best as we can, which we need a lot of help with. <laughs> um, during the program, we focus on manageable tasks rather than having like one big project because a big project can be very intimidating and it sets people up for either pass, like for passing or failing rather than doing something which is like very in the spirit of free software of having small incremental improvements. And this means that sometimes uh, participants do a lot more than you expect them to and sometimes it means they wind up doing a little bit less and the important thing is that they keep contributing and that they're, um, they're learning and becoming a part of the project. Uh, I had a, um, an, 
I was a mentor for a, um, an internship once, and I put enough tasks that I thought were for the entire internship, except that my applicant did all of the tasks during the application process. So that does happen once or twice. But then we've also had people who completely underestimate the projects that they have set aside for the interns, right? So they think that the project that they have, that it would take them, you know, like, three weeks of work to do, but for a newcomer, it takes a lot longer. And so sometimes uh, that's a, a, you know, it, it, having it split into small manageable tasks means that it's not, um, you know, interns don't feel like they're just being set up to fail, which is really important. Um, we require our participants to blog so everybody can see what's happening and what work they're doing and they can become a part of the community a little bit better. We have an IRC channel. We try to have meetings, um, though we've been not as good on that recently, but, um, uh, uh, but we're doing the best we can and having the IRC channel means that there's like a little bit of a support network and that uh, the participants are connected with each other and I can tell you that I've even been in a situation where I've had bad things you know where I've experienced sexism at conferences or on my blog and uh, or in my response and I've gone to the channel uh, to get support from the people who are, are there um, it's just helpful to know that there's a safe you know there's a place where uh, where people understand what you're going through and that makes a big difference um, and we, uh, we help uh, uh, sponsor travel. Um, we have uh, built into our, um, our amount is uh, $500 to travel to conferences to make sure that the interns get to the conferences where the work that they were doing is the most relevant. And that's the best way that we can get people into our community is to have them work on something, then come and talk to everybody about it, and then, um, and then have a welcoming environment at that conference so that they realize that they can take their work to the next level and really become a part of this whole free software thing. Um, after the program, we try to, uh, to we encourage the um, continuation of mentorship relationships, and uh, for some participants, that goes on for a long time after the projects. Um, and it, you know, it it depends on on the particular uh, mentor. But um, we also encourage them to pursue other free software opportunities, and we try to spread those uh, the information about that. As I said, um, a number of people have participated in Google Summer of Code after. Um, so uh, uh, that's pretty, we, we encourage them to present at conferences and we'll review their um, proposals and just encourage them to submit, which is really important. Um, and we also encourage uh, past participants to become mentors and to just generally uh, participate in answering questions and spreading the word about Arichi. Um, most importantly, we hope that our participants value software freedom and that they understand that free and open source software is something that's, a, that's special. And, uh, and taking that to wherever it is that they go next, even if they don't stick around in our communities, is really important. I would be a bad executive director and very remiss if I did not acknowledge the sponsors of Outreachy. We have really cute names for our sponsorship levels. So the very top level is Ceiling Smasher. Um, and, uh, and then we have Equalizer um, and Promoters. And then um, uh, Includers are, uh, are are people, are uh, organizations and companies that support uh, one or more um, uh, interns. Uh, we require that, um, that the communities that participate in Outreachy find the money for at least one internship, and then we do our best to fundraise for more. So some communities have enough money that they can sponsor multiple Outreachy interns, uh, but we require that there is at least one so that we know that the uh, we know that the, the community has some skin in the game, that they really support Outreachy. They're not just signing up because they want us to fund an intern. And it's hard for us to fundraise anyway. We're a charity. We do the best we can. Um, we've luckily been in the situation where we've never had to turn a, uh, a, uh, a, an awesome candidate, uh, an awesome participant down because of funding. And I hope that continues to be the case. Uh, but we just, uh, we just do the best we can uh, with the, the fundraising that we have available to us. So you can help. You are here, which is amazing. Pretty much the way that these talks work, it's so frustrating. The people who come to these talks are usually the people who know about the program exists. They know it's important. They know it has value. And, um, and, and, and usually, as I said, this talk is way more diverse than the, uh, than the rest of the conference. <laughs> so it's always funny. Um, but, but getting the word out, and I think that if you're not a part of these underrepresented groups that are, are uh, that we're trying to outreach to, it's it's perhaps even more important that uh, that you're here because um, it's it's I can't even begin to tell you the injustice of how it feels 
to feel like because you're a part of an underrepresented group, it is your burden to reach out to other people of your group, right? It's, it's so difficult because um, most of the people who are here, as I said at the beginning, there are all of these obstacles, seen and unseen, in participating in the community. And, uh, and you're probably here because you've worked, because you really care. You've worked hard. You're, you, the studies show you have to work that much harder to be seen as, uh, you know, you have to be, work that much harder and be that much better to be seen just as, as just as good as everyone else. So you probably really want to do that thing that drew you here to begin with. So um, thank you. So it's, it's important that, um, that we don't leave the outreach solely to the underrepresented groups. And it's, in fact, everybody else that really needs to hear about these programs and, these, um, and, uh, you know, and the, the problems and, and help, help uh, uh, remedy the situation. Uh, so helping to spread the word is really important. Um, uh, we're a charity, um, and we are not smooth marketers. <laughs> Uh, I, wish we, I wish we were. We don't have a ton of extra resources for marketing. So we really rely on word of mouth and the enthusiasm of people who care about um, these issues and care about free and open source software um, and diversity. So, um, so help support Debian's participation in Outreachy. And if you're involved in another free software community, um, encourage them to participate in, um, in Outreachy. Um, suggesting to your company that they sponsor the program is um, an amazing way to help. Often companies are looking for diversity programs to support, and Outreachy is a very pragmatic program. It is, uh, it, we've got solid metrics, we, are, uh, we have a very deep impact on the individuals that participate, and as the program continues, you, we, we're starting to see the face of software freedom start to change. And I, I, I think that we'll see even more of that as, as time goes by. But a lot of companies are just looking for things like this to, to, um, to fund. And, um, and we've had uh, sponsorships come through in all different kinds of ways. So some companies put it through their philanthropy department. Some put it through engineering because they're funding work that they want done, you know, that they, they think is valuable. Um, and some of them uh, fund it through, you know, a, a, a diversity fund. So there are a whole bunch of different ways that, um, and some fund it through free and open source software sponsorships generally. So there are a bunch of ways, um, and finding someone at your company who cares about that would be, um, you know, really can do a lot. And then donating individually to Outreachy and Conservancy is a huge way to help. Um, we're always sort of at the end of the, the at the end of the day, when we get all these amazing applications in, we're like, OK, so we want to accept all of these people that look like they're going to succeed, and how do we do it? And then I go, and I, uh, we all go, and we knock on doors and sort of say, oh, we just need these two more internships funded, and we can accept everyone. And so far, it's worked, but we have in the past had to draw on, um, on outreachy, general outreachy funds that we've had. Um, and and it's, it's, it's tough. Um, we also hire, um, have hired. A contractor to help us because running the program is so much work. It's like a mountain of work, and we were doing it entirely on volunteer labor for a while, and it was just not tenable. Um, so, uh, so donations would really help a lot. But it's starting to have a really big impact. Um, uh, Google Summer of Code alone went from 7% uh, women in 2011 to 12% in 2016, and it's been a constant increase. The Linux kernel, uh, we've had about 30 women become kernel developers through our program. It's kind of amazing. Um, and so uh, this is a Baturja uh, graph that they put up where 5% uh, of women in the Linux kernel in 2005 to about 10% in 2016. So um, anyway, that's the general idea about Outreachy and how it works. And um, I can now, I think I have like five minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, and I'm gonna. Uh, well, okay, we'll just do that. It's not working, but if you shout it, I'll, I'll repeat it.
I've been very lucky to mentor people in Outreach and Google Summer of Code over a number of years. Um, just one thing I want to share is that a lot of this, and even if you haven't got time for mentoring, um, if you only have time to help encourage people to join the programs, a lot of it is just about giving them the confidence to apply. Um, showing them the videos of the successful um, interns um, participating at DebConf and other events. Um, I've just sent you a photo of one former um, intern. I don't know if you've got access to your email there, but th this is quite exciting. I, I just saw this at a conference recently. Um, Yeah. Uh, okay, um, well, I'll, did you have a question? Or? Okay, now I was just going to, th this was my one point, was just that, um, th just motivating people, showing them photos um, and videos um, to show them that other women are doing this successfully. And, and when they see these things, they, their faces change immediately because they can see that they can do it too. And then they apply. And even if you don't have time to mentor yourself, just helping people to get started. Um, it's not that hard, and, and we can all do that. Um, I have another data point, perhaps, for your um, statistics, because I was mentoring um, four Google Summer of Code students. One of them was a woman, and I have also mentored two women in Outreachy. And my experience was that the women were always uh, same good as a man. Uh, and last year I had uh, one woman in outreach and one in Google Summer of Code. And the woman was very independently working, quite uh, uh, autonomous, and, and the, the man was really leading kick in the ash. So I can say that the woman was really better than the man, explicitly. And this year I'm also very happy. And in addition, I want uh, to say that I'm running for my project some kind of um, mentoring project for one month and I also try to, to get women and I also get got two very good women. So it's, it's not that, as you said, the, the people have the experience that they are bad, so this is not the case. The only difference is that um, um, they need to be a little bit more empowered and to be more self-confident. This was some yeah, I mean, statistically, that's true. Everyone's an individual, so you know you sort of have to take the individuals as they come. So we don't want to generalize too much, but um, but statistically, what you're saying is absolutely true. Hey, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what, from the outreachy perspective, makes a really great mentor. Oh, what a great question. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so there are a bunch of resources that we make available for, for mentors. I think the biggest thing is, that, is to understand that mentorship takes a lot of time. Um, and having, it, uh, having a specific amount of time that you've committed um, every week, um, preferably on more than one day per week, and making yourself available to your mentor, uh, to your mentee. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough line to walk to know sort of you know how much to help and how much to um, you know to let the let the participant um, figure out uh, figure things out on their own. But I think that as long as you make yourself available during specific times and with the time zones considered, um, and then um, you know I think one of the good things about Outreachy is that during the application process you can figure out. Um, where that person is, and you need to meet them wherever it is that they are and understand that they're going to need to learn. I think one of the most important things about mentorship is it's not about getting somebody else to do the thing that you would have done in the same amount of time that you're doing it. It's to understand that we need to bring people into our communities in a way that they can learn and become contributors. So, uh, you know, it, it sometimes can be frustrating for mentors because they think that things should take a certain amount of time and then they take longer or they, people do it differently. But the important thing is to focus on the process and, um, and to help the participants or whoever it is you're mentoring. And it's generally, it doesn't need to be just with an outreachy, but in general with mentoring, it's important to sort of let people understand the ways that they can ask questions, hook them into other members of the community so that they know that they can establish a network and, and help them understand how to learn so that they can answer questions themselves and, and go independently. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, 
I think it's a, a little bit misleading when we tell ourselves that the individual people that, were, that are different from us don't have the confidence to come in because then, uh, say I am a young male developer, um, for me, I don't always notice all the informal channels that have been flown open for me and invited me in that are not available to that person who is different from me. So the idea that there is something about them that lacks confidence is inaccurate. It is something about the institution that it opens doors for some and not others. That's a really excellent point, and that's true across across the board. There are, you know, it, it's it's a little misleading because you think that well, we do so much of our work remotely and online that what difference does it make if someone is part of a different, you know, is is of a different gender or um, or of a different race? But uh, but there are all these subtle cues that are um, subtle and overt ways that people are um, are excluded, and the the biggest, most obvious one is turning up at a conference, like. When you turn up at a conference, and so for example, as a woman, I, when I show up at a conference, there have been times when I have seen like 100 people before I've seen another woman. Like, it is, you're not sure who you should approach, right? It's not like, it, it's, a, it's a totally different experience, and it can be very off-putting, and that's just a metaphor for all of the channels that are not necessarily available um, to everyone equally. Um, when I, the very first time that I signed on to IRC, and I'm old, so I won't say what year it, it was, but it be, the year began with a one. But, uh, but when, I, when I first signed on to IRC, I wasn't thinking about what my handle was, so my handle was Karen, right? And immediately I got, priv messaged by like 20 other people with very questionable handle names and I like logged off immediately. And that's something that would have been invisible to anybody else who had been in the channel that I had signed on to. You just don't see it. So just because you don't see the, uh, the bad behavior doesn't mean it's happening. Because there are so few people participating from these underrepresented groups, they see a disproportionate amount of the bad behavior. And if you're not a part of that group, you're you're, you're just less likely to see it. I have a question on the, on the corporate sponsorship side. Do, you, uh, do companies just contribute to a general fund or do they sponsor specific, uh, specific work or specific uh, projects or how does, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, so the, uh, the way that, that sponsorship has worked previously, or has, the way we, we've designed the sponsorships is that companies can per sponsor particular um, internships. So for example, if you know of a company that wants to sponsor Debian internships, um, that funding can be earmarked for Debian um, internships. Uh, and then we can have sometimes, so for example, when the FSF sponsors, I hope I'm not going too far by saying this, but when the FSF sponsors, they say, oh good, I got a thumbs up from Molly. The, they say uh, this can go towards any GNU project. So, um, so GNU Media Goblin and GNOME have both participated, and so they can be, you know, and, um, and some other projects can say, oh, well, some other companies say, oh, well, I'm happy for, um, for it to go towards internships uh, for these four, um, you know, uh, different communities that participate. And then we have some companies that just give us flat amounts towards our general fund. Um, honestly, th that makes a really big difference, having the money towards the general fund because it just keeps the program going. I, I can't understate how much work it is to just keep the program afloat. And then um, the Software Freedom Conservancy does all of the accounting and all of that stuff. Um, and it's just, it just the, the mountain of work because it's, uh, it's, it's 80 internships per year and each person has to get paid in a different place. There are, you know, we have to manage all the applicants that go into the program, all the different applications. We have to email people about whether they've been accepted and re rejected or, you know, or, or, you know uh, and then just managing, coordinating with all the mentors. We have agreements we have to, it's just like the infrastructure around the program is really big and to make sure, uh, one of the reasons why I think the program has been successful is that where they call it like a high touch program. So like we've, uh, we have a lot of contact with our, on average, with our, um, with our participants, um, but all of that takes time. And whenever anybody has a problem or a question, we want to make sure that they have the appropriate attention. So everything just takes a tremendous amount of time. And getting donations of one minute generally is a really great way to do that. Can we sneak in one more question? Uh, maybe someone who hasn't asked. Oh. Uh, I just. 
Uh, I don't know how much Debian funds at the moment. Uh, do we, is that public knowledge? But I'm not sure what Debian has made available, but there are two interns per year. Um, does well, the SPY quite... board member know if that's public? <laughs> but I, I can't imagine it would be. It strikes me we have a it's slight one. problem with money in Debian in that we can't find things to spend it on. And uh, why don't we just fund as many applicants as we get? Great. I think in the past sometimes, you know, oh, a there's bit, applause. You've got vast amounts of money. In, so why don't, yeah. we, why don't we just fund what we, anybody It like spreads up? it around, right? Because, uh, because if, if Debian funds, so we require that Debian fund one intern to participate and then we really try hard to fundraise for any more. Um, I think in the past there have been rounds where Debian has, contrib has paid for more than one intern. Uh, but some, in some rounds we've contributed general funds, so it would be great to have more well, Debian so money. So how about we fund anybody that doesn't get funded by spon uh, external sponsors or something? Great. Yeah. And then people can know that, Definitely. and and they can think oh, it's not, rather than oh, well, I'm no good, so I won't get funded because I'll be number seven. If there's seven, we'll fund them. Why not? Yes, but we only accept applicants that we think will will are set up at that moment to succeed in the program. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it's one of the things filter. that we that we've figured filter. out. And one more quick question. I know we are over time. Is, is, oh. Oh. Quick, quick, quick. It, it, it wasn't really a question, it's just like about what Kathy was saying. Um, just, I mean, like I grew up in Mexico, and in Mexico, I'm seen as white. My ancestry is mostly from Spain. Uh, and when I came here, it was a shock for me to, to live in Canada. It was a shock for me to discover that uh, that I'm not white, apparently. And <laughs> to start running into a bunch of like sort of subtle racisms and, and, and being treated as an outsider and, and a bunch of things like that. And then, then the next uh, sort of intensification of that came when I changed my hair and, and my style, and then it became uh, much more uh, powerful. And, and even here at this conference, uh, a community I have been participating in for uh, well over 10 years, uh, I don't remember how much. Um, uh, the other day, I was, uh, I was talking to someone, uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, for something um, of the project, and I was singled out for some behavior that I've seen uh, a lot of people engage in at the conference. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether it's right or wrong, or what the specifics are, I don't think it's, it's germane. But I, I, you know, immediately I thought, of course, you know? So the way I look, it's, uh, if, if there's going to be a complaint about that, it, it's going to be about me, you know? And I was questioned about how much I contribute to the project, and you know, no, it's, it's fair. In this specific conference, I, I haven't uh, done a lot, but I have, uh, like specifically financially, I have put in a lot uh, in, in, in the past, and you know, so <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 think, I think it's a common experience. And thank you for sharing that, because I think it informs the overall discussion. Thanks, everybody, for coming to this talk and for helping to promote diversity issues in free software. It's really important. Thanks.